role technology plays in domestic abuse and I'll also um, present some slides around how people can stay safe and there are also some links in at the end of the presentation to um, local and national support services as well. So in terms of how we define domestic abuse, um, we have a home office uh, definition and we've had this definition since 2013. Everything is, is uh, under you know slight review at the moment with the domestic abuse bill. But essentially, as it stands at the moment, the home office defined domestic abuse as an incident or a of controlling coercive or threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between people aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members regardless of gender or sexuality. And that can include but isn't limited to psychological, physical, sexual, financial and emotional abuse. And it's important to say that the definition also includes so-called honour-based violence, female genital mutilation and forced marriage. And it's clear that victims are not confined to one gender or ethnic group. Now, prior to 2013, the definition was somewhat different. The definition didn't refer to a pattern of incidents. It didn't refer to controlling or coercive behaviour and it also said that domestic abuse was only relevant for people aged um, 18 or over. So what we saw in 2013 was a, a change to how the government were defining domestic abuse to really recognise that actually domestic abuse is not about physical incidents. It's not about physical violence. Domestic abuse is about so much more than that. And it's the control and the coercion and the context in which violence may or may not happen that, that really um, underlines what domestic abuse is. And having worked um, with uh, victims and survivors of uh, domestic abuse for, for many years, it's overwhelming how many people say that, that physical violence that's not what domestic abuse is and that's not the hardest part because bruises fade and cuts heal but it's the emotional abuse it's the psychological abuse and constantly wearing someone down that's this damage um, and it's also important to recognize that the government uh, reduced the age to 16 uh, from 18 in 2013 um, and that's important in terms of the age, it's important in terms of who can access domestic abuse services, because if you are uh, under the age of 16, then technically, according to the Home Office definition, you're not a victim of domestic abuse. It would come under the remit of social services um, and would be seen as a child protection issue. But of course, we know that under the age of 16 have intimate relationships, and if you are old enough to be in a relationship, then you are old enough to experience uh, domestic abuse. So um, it's good that we saw the age reduced to 16. Uh, however, you know, th there are many people that, that think that actually that's not low enough. And unfortunately, you know, the research tells us that the extent of physical, sexual and psychological abuse within teenagers' relationships under the age of 16 is really quite prevalent um, and so you know but unfortunately uh, people in that situation don't come under the the home office definition of domestic abuse oh, apologies um, so as I mentioned in 2013 it was the first time that the home office definition had actually talked about control and coercion now this is because in 2013 the government suddenly realised that actually this was a you know this is was a really important part of what domestic abuse was we've known about this um since we've known about domestic abuse in the 1970s and 1980s um that actually you know feminists were were saying it was you know the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s that really brought the issues of domestic and sexual violence to the public consciousness and and to you know political debate um where, and they would talk about power and control, that the domestic abuse isn't about physical violence, it's power and control. But it took until 2013 for that element of domestic abuse to actually reach um, a home office definition. 
So in 2013, the definition said that controlling behaviour is a range of acts designed to make someone subordinate or dependent by isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of the means needed for independence, resistance and escape and regulating their everyday behaviour. Whereas coercive behaviour is an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation and intimidation or other abuse that's used to harm, punish or frighten their victim. Now, this definition and, and the changes and the, and the, the kind of nuance around uh, controlling and coercive behaviour was really welcomed um, by people who work um, you know, with victims and survivors uh, of domestic abuse because it was important that we were moving away from this really kind of narrow focus on physical violence uh, because that, that that's not what does the harm and that it just because you don't suffer physical violence doesn't mean you're not a victim of domestic abuse. So it was really important that we started to see this this shift really um, at the at the government level that we hadn't really seen before. And then in 2015, uh, the government introduced um, the coercive control uh, legislation. So this was an attempt to criminalise the aspect of domestic abuse. And this was the first time that um, the UK government, or the, you know, certainly for England and Wales, that we'd um, attempted to criminalise non-physical um, domestic abuse because, and Theresa May, who, who really kind of uh, pushed for this and advocated for the legislation, you know, was very clear in saying that, you know, what causes the harm in domestic abuse situations isn't the physical violence, it's the psychological abuse. But up until this legislation, that wasn't a criminal offence. It wasn't a criminal offence to coerce someone and to control someone. But of course, it was a physical, a, a, a criminal offence to be physically abusive, to, you know, um, thrill somebody, to cause criminal damage, um, to harass somebody or stalk them. But it, it wasn't a criminal offence for that level of, of control and coercion within an intimate relationship. And so that's what this piece of legislation attempted uh, to address. And essentially, it said that controlling or coercive behaviour is a criminal offence when it's repeated and or continuous, when it has a serious effect on the victim, and that's defined in terms of the person fearing violence or uh, being caused to suffer serious alarm or distress, which affects their day-to-day -day activities. And the two people need to be personally connected. So they need to be in an intimate personal relationship or ex-relationship or family members. But you may be thinking, OK, so but what actually what is the controlling or the coercive behaviour? How, how do we actually define that? And that's one of the biggest challenges, really, uh, with this legislation, because there is no definitive list because it is really dependent on the individual person's um, situation and uh, the context of that relationship. So the government did um, present a, a range of examples that could, but not necessarily do, indicate aspects of coercive control. So isolating someone from their friends and family, depriving someone of their basic needs, monitoring someone's time, taking control over aspects of their everyday lives, such as where they can go and who they can see and what they can wear, um, threats to reveal or publish private information about somebody. We'll come back to that when we look at image-based sexual abuse a little bit later. Um, repeatedly putting someone down, such as telling them that they are worthless. Monitoring someone via online communication tools or using spyware. Again, that's something that, that we'll talk about as well. So you can see that there are a range of different examples of what might constitute coercive control. But you may also be thinking, OK, but how would we have evidence of that? Because uh, in a criminal court case, you have to prove something beyond all reasonable doubt. And that's the biggest challenge, really, in terms of coercive control, is that how do you have the evidence of somebody repeatedly 
putting them down within an intimate relationship if there are no witnesses to that and you know we know uh, that perpetrators are, are very clever and that they're you know unlikely to um, show their true colours in front of witnesses so uh, you know this has been a challenge and um, the police and the wider criminal justice system you know it takes time for new legislation to to really um, you know em embed and, and translate into uh, prosecutions and especially a criminal offence as uh, unique as this really um, it, you know in terms of it's so dependent on an individual's uh, relationship and, and the context of that um, so you know we, we, we're seeing improvements as time goes on uh, but uh, but the number of prosecutions remains minimal in comparison to the number of people who we know are experiencing passive control uh, within an abusive relationship. So I've got a few slides now with a, uh, a bit of a quiz. Um, I haven't set this up as a, an actual quiz where you can um, actually poll just in case because I wasn't sure um, what type of technology I want to be using to access today and you kind of need two uh, devices um, so I'll, uh, I'll ask the questions and I'll you know let you think of <laughs> your answers uh, and then I'll tell you what the correct one is so how many incidents of domestic violence were there in 2018-19 according to the crime survey for England and Wales now the crime survey isn't um, it's not about police recorded data it's um, the, the national crime survey that's done um, where uh, they approach people and they ask them, you know, to, to fill in this questionnaire. So it isn't people that have necessarily reported, but it's a way of trying to estimate crime within the, the general population in England and Wales. So do you think it was 1.6 million women and 786,000 men, 750,000 women and 380,000 men, or 249,000 women and 58,000 men? Well, it may surprise you to know that the answer is A, 1.6 million women and 786,000 men. The next uh, question, what percentage of people report domestic abuse? Is it 75%, 40% or 10%? And uh, the answer to that, again, which may surprise you, is 10%. Um, it's estimated that only 10% of people actually report um, domestic abuse to statutory services. So, you know, whenever we're talking about domestic abuse and figures, we're only ever talking about the tip of the iceberg, really. Domestic violence occurs in same-sex relationships more than in heterosexual relationships. It doesn't really happen in same-sex relationships or to the same extent as in heterosexual relationships. And the answer um, is to the same extent um, as in heterosexual relationships. Some research suggests that it happens even more um, you know, in same-sex relationships. So it's, it's really important because I th there are so many <laughs> myths and stereotypes around domestic abuse. And whenever we talk about domestic abuse, most people will automatically think about a male perpetrator and a female victim. And while the statistics, and we'll, we'll kind of come on to that in a minute, may suggest that actually that's that's the majority um, of cases may well be in a heterosexual relationship and with a male perpetrator and a female victim. That is by no means everybody's experience. And it is really important that we don't assume that somebody can't be a victim of domestic abuse because they're male and they have a female partner or because they're male and they have a male partner or they're female and have a female partner. It doesn't matter what your gender or sexuality or background or education level is, domestic abuse is something that can happen to any one of us at any time in our lives. Um, so it's really important that we, we don't get caught up in, in kind of those common uh, myths and stereotypes that are, you know, perpetuated uh, by the media and, um, you, you know, within soaps and, uh, you know, literature more broadly. People with disabilities are twice as likely to experience domestic violence than people without less likely to experience domestic violence than people without disabilities or unlikely to experience domestic violence at all. Now this is a really uh, important issue and it's a 
I always find it a really sad reflection um, on our society, but unfortunately, people with disabilities are twice as likely to experience people than without disabilities. And that goes for both men and women. And a lot of the literature suggests that women with disabilities in particular are up to 10 times more likely to experience um, domestic um, and sexual violence than women without disabilities. And this ties into the issue of vulnerability um, and perpetrators of abuse are very good at identifying people that may be vulnerable in some way and um, and unfortunately perpetrators uh, do exploit that so uh, it, it, it's really important that we that we recognize actually that there you know that there are groups that you know are more likely to experience domestic abuse by by virtue um, of their vulnerability and that, that it's really important that we uh, make help available in what year did rape become a, a, in rape in marriage become a criminal offence? Was it 1921, 1961 or 1991? I wish I could tell you it was 1921, but unfortunately it was 1991. Um, and again, you know, I, that to, you know, obviously I don't know how old people are in the audience, uh, but, you know, I was certainly um, alive then. and. Um, still feels relatively recent history um, but prior to 1991 it was not possible for um, a husband to be prosecuted for raping his wife because marriage was seen as automatic consent so it wasn't possible for a woman to say no um, if they were married because according to the law, when you were married, you automatically, that in terms of conjugal rights, um, that, that was uh, just uh, an assumption, that was a given. And that was changed, thankfully, in 1991. Not because society had got to a point where it recognised that actually um, women were allowed to say no, even within the context of a marriage, uh, but actually it was to protect uh, women who were married but separated uh, from their husbands. But th that, so that was how the, change in law came about but but that wasn't it's it wasn't relevant to how the law was applied it protected all women however uh, what we see and have seen over the years is a real um, difficulty in prosecuting um, those offences because even though the legislation changed views and perceptions of people within the criminal justice system and general public on juries still um, and and uh, even to this day still struggle with that that concept um, uh, because of you know that they may have, uh, have had um, sex previously and and so you know this whole issue of consent gets very muddled for people but actually it doesn't matter um, no means no in whatever context and then finally when did stalking become a criminal offence was it 1992 2002 or 2012 it's a little bit of a trick question this one <laughs> um, it was 2012 that stalking uh, became a criminal offence in its own right. However, in 1997, we saw the introduction of the Protection from Harassment Act. And that technically did criminalise stalking. However, what was written on paper wasn't necessarily translated into practice. And there was a lot of misunderstandings about what stalking actually was or wasn't. And so it wasn't until 2012 that the law was clarified. Um, so again, I mean, hopefully for everybody, that is quite recent history um, and, and just shows that, you know, we things can take quite a long time to, to change in society. Oh, um, I forgot, there's a few more questions. Uh, so on average, how many women a week are killed as a result of domestic violence in the UK? Is it five, two or one? Unfortunately, the answer is two. Um, and that number actually increased quite dramatically during uh, lockdown. And I'm sure um, you know many of you will have heard about the impact of lockdown for people who are experiencing domestic abuse. We were essentially putting victims, you know, creating victims uh, to be prisoners, really, with um, with a perpetrator. Um, and the number of homicides actually uh, increased by a third during um, the first few weeks of lockdown. Women are most at risk of life-threatening or fatal violence when they have recently left the violent partner, they are still in the relationship, or the risk doesn't change. 
Well, the research is really clear on this. Women are most at risk of life-threatening violence or, or murder at the point of separation, so when they have recently left the relationship. 80% of women who are murdered are murdered at or just after the point of separation in the UK. Um, and that figure um, also translates uh, to other countries like America. So the the kind of, you know, most people think, oh, well, if somebody tells me that they're experiencing this, I need to tell them to leave so that they'll be safe. But actually, the most dangerous thing you can say to somebody. So if anybody ever um, approaches you and, and, you know, or discloses to you that they are experiencing this, the best thing that you can do is signpost them to specialist services such as Women's Aid or, you know, other domestic abuse services who understand the risk and who can help somebody to leave safely because not only does the risk to a woman increase but it also the risk to um, her children if she has children with the perpetrator can also significantly increase so it's really important uh, that we don't just tell people to leave um, that we support them to do it safely and what age group are most likely to have been murdered by a current or former partner is it 16 to 29 30 to 39 or 40 to 49 well, the answer is 16 to 29. Um, the younger age group are actually much more likely to experience um, domestic abuse and uh, murder um, than other age groups. So, um, just talking about young people, according to the Crime Survey for England and Wales, young people young people are more likely to experience domestic abuse than any other age group, and that's true for both men and women. But again, if we think about stereotypes, um, then you know people sometimes think that domestic abuse is what happens to you know older people who are ch who have children or are married, but actually we know that domestic abuse. Um, is really significant in young people's relationships uh, for both for men and women. So it's really important that we do everything that we can to raise awareness. And it's, you know, certainly from my perspective, seeing that schools will have to um, deliver education on healthy relationships from this year is really, really important because, you know, everybody needs to understand what is healthy and what isn't healthy um, and you know that's the only way that we're going to kind of reduce the prevalence of domestic abuse going forward and just a note on gender um, so you know as I explained earlier it is not only women who experience domestic abuse and it's not only men who perpetrate domestic abuse it's really important to to get that message across because the last thing that we ever want is for somebody who is in an abusive relationship or experiencing abuse from a, a family member to think that what's happening to them doesn't fit into this and so it's there, therefore it can't be abuse because that is not the case at all. What the research does suggest is that women are nearly twice as likely to experience abuse than men and there's a particular issue around sexual abuse and murder. Women are nearly five times more likely to be murdered by a partner or ex-partner. And women are nearly five times more likely to suffer sexual abuse by a partner or ex-partner. Um, but again, that's not to say that um, you know it's only women who experience abuse at the at the hands of man, uh, at the hands of men. But there is a particular issue um, around. Um, homicide. Um, nearly half of all women who are murdered in the UK are murdered by um, a current or former partner. It's only 6% of men. So you can see that, that, that there is a, a disparity in terms of the risk of, of fatal violence when it comes to domestic abuse for men and women. So moving on to technology. Technology is a huge part of, you know, many people's lives, certainly not everyone's, but but many people's lives. Um, according to the Office for National Statistics, virtually all our, uh, adults aged between 16 and 44 years in the UK were recent internet users, um, compared with 47% of adults um, aged 75 years and over. 93% of UK children aged 15 owned a smartphone in 2019. Um, it's estimated that 79% of adults in the UK own a smartphone and 
what I find really terrifying as the mother of a five-year-old, uh, is that half of UK 10-year-olds own a smartphone in 2020. I'm really not sure how I'm going to navigate that situation when she gets to 10, although she has already told me that somebody she knows has, has a phone. Um, I've explained that that's not happening for her. Uh, but obviously, there's only so far we can go. Um, you know, I, I, if I could move somewhere without any uh, internet connection, I possibly would. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not really an option. So technology and domestic abuse. While technology you know can make our lives easier it can help us keep connected with people you know there are so many benefits to technology but there are also some serious consequences particularly within the context of uh, domestic abuse and technology is really a tool that perpetrators can use to maintain control and to you know uh, keep surveillance over uh, their victim um, and um, it's just an extension of the abuse. So the types of things that people may experience a um, combination of technology and domestic abuse are constant calls, text messages and online messages, publishing posts online that encourage other people to harass and abuse a victim, uh, constant calls, message friends, we kept friends requests to family and friends, threats to share information or actually sharing intimate images of somebody online, harassment through business social media pages and work email addresses, threats to share information online such as confidential information which might be screenshots of messages, photos or something else that could cause embarrassment, um, access to online bank accounts and social media accounts and insisting on apps such as find my iPhone or enabling GPS tracking. So you can see just from these examples that there are a range of ways that perpetrators can use technology um, against a victim. And we'll consider some of these um, in a little bit more detail. So um, this um, news story um, really shows the, the how technology is a, a tool of uh, coercive control in some situations. So. Um, Eulene Hope was um, a, a self-declared technophobe who escaped the control of her tech-savvy abusive ex-partner after 10 years. He'd set up her email and social media accounts, which then meant that he had full access to them. He also uh, replaced her flip phone with an iPhone, which at first sounds really nice, but of course he then set that up um, and he set it up to be mirrored onto their iPad which meant that he could monitor all of her calls and messages and he also activated phone's location tracker saying that it would help her get the bus but of course it was always so that he knew exactly where she was um, at all times and when she noticed things like the iPad ringing when her phone rang he said he was just testing a new app. Now you know technology in this situation was a way that you know the perpetrator could know all communications monitor all communications that Eulene was having with other people if she'd been planning to leave him and you know had tacted somebody for advice sent an email made a telephone call he would have been able to see that information which would have drastically increased the risk to her so it's really important that, that we're all aware actually of the role of, of technology and particularly if you yourself are not particularly um, you know up to date with the different ways technology can be used but you know a partner is um, then you know that that can be a, an issue to really consider I um, did a project um, last year for uh, the police up in Northumbria who'd uh, developed a special uh, unit to deal with uh, victims of domestic abuse who were suffering cyber stalking and harassment and they became experts very quickly in the in the range of different types of technology and apps that were out there and some of the apps that are available kind of through the dark web are really quite frightening in terms of um, what they can do and they're very difficult to detect on someone's phone as well the, in one case that you know the police found it 
through accident really but they were able to show that the perpetrator had completely mirrored um the victim's phone and was receiving every single communication um that she was um enable to, to enable um him to monitor her movements so you know this is a, a, a very real issue and just shows how technology is part of of that coercive control now the internet of things so alexa and the ring doorbell and all of these types of um you know technology that again have you know can bring such benefits to people's lives you know the thought as we approach winter of being able to you know turn your heating on before you get home you know what a great thing however abusers are you know using these networked home devices to control harass and stalk their victims so not only can perpetrators spy on their partners so for example with a ring doorbell you can see exactly who's been to the house you can see exactly when uh, the victim has left the house and when they're coming back and how long they've been out um, but they can also use it as a way of gaslighting so gaslighting is where you're trying to um, you know mess with someone's head to an extent that they're questioning themselves and they're questioning what's happening so for example suddenly playing music in the house or changing the temperature or turning all the lights off you know those are ways that a perpetrator can control and gaslight their victim when they're not even in the same property so you know while the internet of, thing, of things has been fantastic for many people it is again another tool that perpetrators um, of domestic abuse can use um, to intimidate and uh, control their victims. In addition, perpetrators can use things like Xboxes and Playstations uh, to spy on their victims. So refuge um, organisation have found a rise in the number of women where iPads, Xboxes and Playstations have been hacked by perpetrators to gain full access to their accounts, but also to trace information such as the child's location, who they're speaking to and what games they're playing. And that can be really dangerous if you think that somebody may have um, gone into a refuge um, because of domestic abuse they've got children children playing on their uh, you know they've taken their console for example then you know they could be showing the location of the refuge uh, similarly even just with a mobile phone you know if children go into refuge and they've got a mobile phone then there is a chance that the perpetrator had set up GPS tracking on that mobile phone. So when people come into refuge, it's really important that refuges are kind of going through a almost like a, a digital risk assessment uh, to make sure that there is no way that a perpetrator um, could know where they are uh, when they're you know um, in a refuge and need to be um, in a safe place. And then something I mentioned earlier is image-based sexual abuse, or you may have heard. Um, it referred to as revenge porn. So this was made a criminal offence um, uh, in 2014. And so the legislation says it's a criminal offence to share private sexual materials, which could be photos or videos, of another person without their consent with the purpose of causing embarrassment or distress. Um, and the offence applies both online and offline um, and to images that are shared electronically or in more traditional ways so uh, uploading images on the internet sharing by text and email or showing someone a physical or electronic image and research suggests that the majority of the image-based abuse incidents uh, occur within a domestic abuse um, relationship and this is particularly well even more of an issue in young people's relationships when images you know sharing intimate images has become so much more commonplace but once those images are shared then there is that risk that somebody uh, could share them now if we're talking about people under the age of 18 then uh, we're also talking about you know additional offenses of sharing uh, indecent images of children as well but uh, in terms of adults it is a criminal offense to share an intimate image without someone's consent um, but unfortunately once those images are up on the internet it's really difficult to to get them back down there are, and, and there is um, a helpline that's been set up for people who've uh, been victims of, of this uh, type of abuse and um, that I'll get to that at the end of the um, presentation um, but yeah it's a it, it's a real issue particularly within domestic abuse 
And then we've kind of talked about some of the way perpetrators might use uh, technology within a relationship. But when relationships have ended, you know, sometimes people think that when somebody leaves an abusive relationship, that, that that's the end of the abuse. And anybody who has worked kind of in this area and, and works for, you know, charities or the police will be able to tell you that unfortunately that is not the case. The end of the relationship does not mean the end of the abuse. And so many people experience post-separation uh, stalking and harassment. And one of the key um, tools used um, in that is it's through cyber stalking. Um, so perpetrators will use technology to continue um, that abuse even when the relationship has ended. So victim support refer to stalking, uh, that stalking can be just defined as persistent and unwanted attention that makes you feel pestered and harassed. It includes behaviour that happens two or more times directed at or towards you by another person which causes you to feel alarmed or distressed or to fear that violence may be used against you. Now, in 2017, um, we uh, did a piece of research with the Home Office um, and it was with victims of stalking and harassment who had, uh, in England and Wales, who had con reported their um, experiences to the police. And as part of that research, we interviewed nine women who were all being harassed and stalked by their ex-partner and all of them had suffered domestic abuse within the relationship. And it was really clear that the end of the relationship had not been the end of the abuse. Um, so, for example, one woman said, I was in work one night in the small hours and I had over 100 messages. Another said, I cut him off completely. The emails and text messages were just incessant. Every day, 60 emails, 20 text messages every day. And I said, he just used my text message phone calls. I think he sent 50 text messages in one day. So you can imagine trying to work, trying to deal with children, trying to go about your daily business and actually your phone is constantly going off, constant bombardment from a perpetrator um, using technology um, to maintain that harassment um, and that control. But it wasn't just online. So of the victims that we spoke to, not only were they being stalked via technology, but they were also being stalked in person. For example, one of them said, when he started turning up at my workplace and the last straw was when he followed me home. And that was something that we found throughout all of the women that we spoke to, is that actually it wasn't just online stalking that was happening, that it was also in person. And you know, the impact of that is that there is nowhere that somebody who then feels safe because their online space is being targeted, as is their physical space, as is in this situation, their workspace as well. And it was also really clear how social media um, was used as a by perpetrators to um, to continue to stalk and harass victims. As one woman said, he'd been using all of these fake uh, accounts and using attempts to get through. Then he contacted my friend on Facebook and sent her messages giving out loads of personal information from when we were together, which I was absolutely horrified at. And that's what made me think, I can't handle this anymore. And, you know, the thing with social media is that, you know, not everybody, but people who engage with social media may, actually live a proportion of their lives on social media, that it's a way to connect with other people, to keep in contact with people, um, and people genuinely live part of their life through um, things like Facebook and Twitter. The problem then is that if you're experiencing stalking and harassment through these forums, then impacts on where you feel um, and by encouraging other people or contacting other people around the victim you know and posting information that's private or confidential or embarrassing you know essentially it means that victims are likely to withdraw from social media but then that means that they're not being able to live part of their life that they should be able to live. And in terms of impact, it was really evident the impact that being stalked and harassed by an ex-partner, um, which always involved kind of technology as well, um, the impact that that was having on uh, people's lives. So as one woman said, you could walk out there and think, 
I've had enough. I just want to end it all because what's the point? No one's going to help me. I'm never going to be free. And as I said, there's been really low points for me where I've kind of said, you know, what? actually, why don't I just end life? Because there's nowhere to go with this. And finally, it's kind of very much got to the point that I don't go out of the house unless I've actually got somebody with me. The impact of stalking and harassment, particularly through technology, but also in person, means that people are not able to live their lives without constantly looking over their shoulder. And it doesn't matter whether you're online, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, you know, at work, out with friends, walking your children to school, there is a constant fear and constant threat. But there are uh, lots of uh, support services and things that people can do to help stay safe online. And, you know, certainly in the last few years, we've seen, you know, specialist services produce a number of facts and advice and guidance for people who, um, you know, who do spend a lot of their time online or use a lot of technology about how they can, um, the strategies that they can employ to keep themselves safe. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so, for example, on Twitter, um, you know, and and you know, some aspects of social media are better than others at trying to help people keep safe as well online. You know, because unfortunately, there are, you know, there are dark aspects to social media. You know, there are trolls. That there, there, you know, there are people who, you know who seem to, you know, thrive off making threats to people and, and you know, um, there's definitely a dark side of humanity shown on social media. Um, so, you know, some platforms are better than others at, at trying to help people um, stay safe. But it's possible to stop other people seeing your tweets, you can disable your location, you can block block someone who's being abusive, um, you can report abuse through Twitter, and you can also use your report as evidence if you need to go to the police. Uh, Facebook, Women's Aid have got a really helpful uh, guide with Facebook. They've worked together to um, help people kind of, you know, navigate how to help um, stay safe online. Email accounts, the Network for Surviving Stalking has got some information on how to stay anonymous when creating new email accounts. Um, and here are uh, just some kind of local uh, and national um, services, telephone numbers and uh, links for um, other organisations that will be able to um, help in terms of um, staying safe with uh, domestic abuse, um, particularly around technology as well. Uh, and that's it from me. I think I've just about finished on time there uh, to allow us uh, some time for questions. Uh, that's fantastic. So far, nobody's asked any questions, but if anyone would like oh. to ask you a question, uh, the chat facility is at the bottom right. If you click where there are some purple arrows um, and pop that out, there's a little speech bubble. Um, so if anyone would like to ask a question now about Holly's presentation, then do so now. I think you might be off the hook, Holly. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Neither was I. I was, I'd got my notebook <laughs> ready to uh, collate them throughout the session. Uh, in that case, I will turn my video back on. Okay, so... Um, not sure if I'm the one on screen now, whether it's still Holly's presentation. Um, but I'm Lottie. I'm one of the community hub assistants at Halzone College. Um, I'm going to sort of end up the session. I was going to do a Q&A with Holly, but as no one said any, then we'll just finish up here. Um, I'm going to be the one that's running the mailing list for these sessions. We have another event in October, which is to do with mental health uh, and the impact that COVID-19 has had on people's mental health. 
Um, I'm going to pop a slide up in just a second with my email address. If anyone would like to be added to that mailing list, then we can keep you updated with all the events that University Centre Hells Owen are doing. Um, I will also be sending out an email after this session within the next couple of days asking for feedback. Um, that would really help us. This is our first online event. Um, we didn't quite know how it was going to go, but it's gone really well. Oh, uh, Lynn has just asked a question. She wanted to ask if there was anywhere for males to get support, Holly. Uh, yes, yes, there are. Um, uh, there's the um, Mankind initiative um, that has a helpline for male victims um, and uh, depending whether it's um, somebody who's um, heterosexual or, or gay, um, the uh, the Gallup helpline that's on the slides um, uh, can help men in same-sex relationships who are experiencing abuse. But mankind is probably the, the best kind of one-stop shop. Um, yeah. <laughs> in turn, I've just seen a question about the domestic abuse bill. Uh, it's it's very nearly uh, <laughs> there, but um, Obviously, we've, yeah, it, it's been really unfortunate, not only with uh, Brexit, but also then coronavirus. <laughs> so um, everything kind of ground to a halt this year. Uh, but but it is definitely happening. Um, it, it's just uh, it's implementation. Okay, that's great. Um, Keep your questions coming if you do have any. I also, oh, thank you, Kayla. That's good. <laughs> uh, Shaz has asked if we were able to send some important stats so we can share on our platforms. Um, um, you have, uh, can I have your slides, Holly, or not? Yes, yeah, yeah, you can have the slides. That's not a problem. Okay, we can send those out to you guys. And thank you, Kayla. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Okay, so as I was mentioning just before, um, I'll be sending out an email. It's also got the link to our website for the University Centre House Owen that says all our upcoming events, um, how you can get in touch with us. If you're interested in studying at higher education, this is a partnership between House Owen and Worcester. Um, and thank you for attending our lecture. Hopefully see you in October, perhaps. <laughs> thank you.